I think it depends on how you define vision. Uh, if it's a sense that the way I enjoyed most spending time was dancing, it was from the time I was a very small child when I sort of puttered around the house. Uh, and uh, that's four or five years old. I remember already having a, a regimen, uh, and it was the way that I always identified myself. Uh, if you're speaking of professionally, it was not until I was after college, until I had graduated. So it was much, much later that I made a professional commitment to it because, quite frankly, I didn't think it wise. I was my own interior parental force, uh, and it's uh, very difficult to justify a profession as a dancer because it's very difficult to earn a living, because there's very little continuity, and because just when you arrive at the apex uh, of your uh, skills, it's time to retire. Uh, and consequently, it seemed like a perhaps not wise investment of a substantial portion of my life. But as it turned out, I decided that uh, since it was the thing that I felt I did the best, that uh, I owed it to all that be to pursue it, uh, and that that was what I had to do, whether it meant I was going to be able to earn a living or not. You called it vision. I call it analyzing what my strengths were. It just so happened there was no market whatsoever for my strengths, uh, unless I was interested in becoming a show dancer, for which I tried, but I'm not tall enough. Uh, also, uh, when I auditioned for the Radio City Rockettes, they said, we love your fuetes, but can't you smile? Uh, and things of that nature transpired between me and a commercial future. So uh, I managed to find a way of subsisting in the beginning by doing odd jobs, Kelly Girl temp work, uh, selling perfume at Macy's, uh, and uh, any and everything to be able to sustain studying and beginning a career with a group of dancers who were willing to devote five years, really, of their lives to me, working very seriously with complete commitment for not a penny. This is not a pleasant route for many young people to consider, I would imagine, uh, and either you have to be hopelessly passionate, I guess is the word that gets devoted here, uh, or uh, very stupid, uh, and none of us were very stupid. We were all college graduates, actually, but we all believed that we could make an impact on something that was very important to us, which was dancing and the future of dancing uh, and what uh, could be accomplished, uh, and we determined we would do that. We thought that there were certain possibilities uh, in terms of physical movement, in terms of community, and in terms of what dance could address in our society. And those were the issues that we went after. Uh, and uh, we worked uh, with a great deal of rigor, uh, which is to say we were very, very uh, dedicated. We worked six days a week. Uh, we worked at least six hours every day. Uh, we did not perform much at all. It was really about the experience of learning and exploring and growing for five years. Well, in those days, male dancers, as they are still today, uh, are uh, a rarer breed than women. Uh, and a good male dancer, a male dancer, frankly, as strong as we were, was very difficult to come by if you couldn't afford to pay them because there was work for them that was available in all the major companies. Uh, that's what we said. The truth of the matter is we didn't want them. Uh, Martha Graham also began her first company as all women. Uh, and I think it's because... In modern dance, the female force has always been a very potent one. Uh, modern dance in this country, in any case, is genuinely, gen generally laid at the doorstep of female creators, Isadora Duncan, Ruth St. Dennis, Martha Graham, Doris Humphrey. Uh, and that the next generation were men, but spun off from that generation. Eric Hawkins, Maurice Cunningham, Paul Taylor, all came from the women. Uh, and because uh, it was a primarily female force, uh, I decided that we should not, in a way, pollute the experiment. Uh, it's like mixed tennis. It's a different game. Male tennis, let's be honest, men and women are very different athletes. Uh, and frankly, I didn't want to deal with the male potential. I wanted to deal with the female potential, plus which obviously men and women bond very differently. Uh, and at that time, we wanted to begin very simply. We used no costumes, we used no music, we had no partnering. We wanted just to explore movement in time and space. And in order to keep that experiment, as you've called it, which I think is accurate, pure, 
we determined that it should be sexually oriented only as women. And then after five years, the first man was introduced. Uh, and bit by bit, uh, I came to be much more interested in technical matters like partnering and so forth until it's been become fully integrated. But our partnering, for example, evolved in an entirely different way than it would have had we had men from the beginning because we had to develop the strength, not only physically but emotionally, that is very different from how most women are when they're partnered. So, uh, I mean, I do weight training and have for quite a while. Uh, and I'm much stronger than most women. Uh, consequently, when I work with a man or when I'm partnered by a man, I can do things no other women can do, just in terms of counterbalances and how I support myself against him. And we can actually go into kinds of movement that haven't been available before, simply because I've strengthened myself as a woman, not because I've weakened him. With each piece that I've completed, uh, I have worked to make it intact and in that each of them has been uh, an equal high. Uh, I, I, it's like children, a mother refuses to pick out one as a favorite and I can't do any better with the dances. Um, and I, I, I'm sure that as I've made major transitions, the rewards have been different. The rewards of dancing myself are very different from uh, choreographing. The rewards of working with dancers you've worked intimately with is very different from dancers that uh, belong to a company you go into. Uh, the rewards of extending your discipline out and incorporating whole new elements, for example, as I begin to try to deal with film and the element of storytelling and putting a dramatic narrative at the spine of the action rather than simply abstract time and space, uh, this is a very big shift and I'm sure the rewards will be different. But uh, the reward that I felt for doing a piece called The Fugue in 1970, 60, 1969 uh, will never be surpassed because I knew then what an accomplishment it was and how far I had come in order to be able to make counterpoint, which is what that represented. Uh, how to link two lines in relationship to one another so that they were bound and reinforced one another. Uh, and uh, you give your own accomplishments and that's what reward is about. It's not about honors, it's not about celebrity, it's certainly not about money. Yes, uh, I would say that for the first five years I pretty much seized things, uh, but Bob Joffrey uh, saw a piece called The Bix Pieces at the Delacorte in 1971 ish. Uh, and Bob decided from that piece, he had the breadth of vision that allowed him to see that what I was doing could be translated to what his dancers understood. Well, I already knew this because I had been studying classical ballet for a long time, but a lot of people insisted again on a wall, walls I'm beginning to think are very unhealthy things, between modern dance and ballet, and that this, this gulf should be between the two, and that the two disciplines were totally separate, and if you did one, you couldn't do the other. But Bob saw that what I did had a very strong balletic base to it, uh, and he asked me to make a piece for his company. That took a real uh, leap of faith on his part, uh, and is what's ordinarily called a break because it certainly is what introduced me into the commercial world. From there, I made another piece for the Joffrey called As Time Goes By, and after that I did Push Comes to Shove for Ballet Theater with Barishnikov. From Push, Milos Forman saw that piece and asked me if I would do hair. From hair, I was able to begin working in pictures and to extend my career into television. And now uh, I am very fortunate because I am in a position where I must, I need to expand the definition of movement much beyond the parameters of what can be accomplished in dancing per se. There are ideas and then there are ideas. The piece was not without a certain amount of calculation. That's the first piece I did for the Joffrey. Uh, and I went for a season to watch the Joffrey company and the Joffrey audience before I made the piece. Uh, and it was very distinctly tailored for both the audience and for the company. On the other hand, uh, it is extremely arrogant and very foolish to think that you can ever outwit your audience. And all you can do is make your sincerest stab at saying, hey, I think you could understand what I'm trying to say if I say it this way. I think I know you well enough that this is how I need to say it for you. 
I don't consider that selling out. I consider that going halfway to meet a person, and I consider that to be what communications is all about. Deuce Coop was very successful in that regard. As far as watching, I was in it. So uh, I was too busy hopping around backstage to have any sense about what it was doing to the audience out front. I was having too much fun. I'm not one who divides music, dance, or art into various categories. Uh, either something works or it doesn't. Uh, I don't really think of, uh, and I don't mean this, but I'm going to say it anyway. I don't really think of pop art and serious art as being that far apart. That is a total lie. I think of them as being completely different, and I don't think of them as being that far apart. And this is one of the things that we have to accept about art is that it's full of paradoxes and contradictions, and they're equally true. Both sides. It's also, I think, going to be true that the 20th century is, is the domain in the classical ballet uh, of the, the classical male dancer in a way that it was never before. It was always about the ballerina, uh, and part of that is because the choreographers were always men. Consequently, they shaped the roles for women as they wished them to be. Uh, when I started choreographing for classical ballet companies, there had been before me two women who had ever made a ballet on a classical company. Uh, and so, of course, I'm interested in the male dancer, plus which uh, not only Misha, but Rudy was a virtuoso, uh, uh, Valela. Uh, there are these days uh, young men dancing who have a power and a potency that we respond to because of athletics. We're trained, unfortunately, and indoctrinated in the facts that the, the male physicality can be marketed in a way the female cannot. Consequently, you have the multi-million dollar athletes in the male world and practically none in the female. Uh, and this has had an impact in the dance world. Uh, and the stars there in the classical world these days are men. And I was fortunate to love men, so I could put them on stage and make roles for them and move through their bodies in a way that they enjoy doing uh, and that they responded to, as the ballerinas have to male choreographers for centuries. First of all, I would have to uh, challenge the term modern dance. I don't really use that in relation to my work. Uh, I simply think of it as dancing. I think of it as moving. Uh, I think of it as involving as much, at least as much, of a ballet technique as a so-called traditional modern dance technique. So uh, I think that uh, that was a lot of the issue, was evolving a technique that we felt we owned. Uh, we went back to beginning building blocks. We went back to very simple things like walking, running, skipping, things that belong to everybody that are not called modern dance, that are not claimed by the ballet. Uh, and then from there, we began to see certain parallels. And then it was no big deal to, as we say, goose it up a notch. I mean, we could kick it up back to where the stylization had been because we knew where it came from. But we took nothing for granted in the beginning. It's not about being turned on. It's about being not turned off. Uh, I think that it's something everybody, not just dancers, everybody has to do on a daily basis or else they're going to be in trouble because uh, not only are they physically out of shape, which most people are, uh, but they don't know how to gauge their foundation. They don't know their bottom line. That comes from physical work. Uh, and I don't think politicians should be allowed into power who are not familiar with their bodies because that's where a bottom line is. And I know that they would make totally different decisions if they felt responsible simply for their own bodies, for starters for example. I think that anybody who wants to challenge their mind to operate, any artist, any writer, any economist, any entrepreneur who wants their mind to function at a peak knows they have to work physically at something, whatever, on a daily basis. It is a necessary part of the human uh, uh, machine. We're a machine and we have to be worked in the same way we have to be fed. So it's not a question of being turned on. It's a question of respecting a necessity. My mother was a dominant force in my life, uh, and she had 
very specific ideas about education, which was you should know everything about everything. It was quite simple. Uh, so uh, there, there was no uh, exclusivity and there really was no judgment, which is a good thing for someone who still thinks of themselves as a very basic American. I think that uh, I had a very eclectic and in a way a very democratic education. Uh, and I'm, I'm grateful for that. Uh, I began ear training when I was about six months old. My mother was a concert pianist uh, and she started all of her children uh, with music before they were a year old. Uh, and then she began to see that I had a musical gift. Uh, and that I should be tutored outside the house because she didn't want it to become too much uh, an amateur situation. She wanted it to be objectified. So uh, I started formal piano training when I was four, uh, and from there I had little violas and I had uh, dancing lessons of every sort and description and painting lessons in German. wasn't taught in the high school, so I had German and shorthand in case I ever needed to be a secretary, or if I didn't need to be a secretary, at least when I went to college I would be able to take all my lectures down verbatim and then go back and see what the professor had said. That's the downside of my mother's education because she made no selections uh, and uh, she made it seem as though one had a lifetime to do that. That's not true. A young person has to start making decisions for themselves at a much earlier age than, uh, a, a, than an overbearing parent allows one. Uh, and I think that in combination with the degree to which uh, a, 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 a childhood uh, and the ability to socialize was taken away, was eradicated from my life, uh, is a stiff price to pay for the education that I received. But, you know, six of one, half dozen of another, uh, I have the wherewithal to uh, challenge myself uh, my entire life. That's, uh, that's a great gift. Uh, and. Uh, the rest of the pieces I uh, work at, uh, at reassembling for myself. I not only have uh, a very intimate connection with rhythm because uh, of I'm, I'm sure that children uh, who are fortunate to have professional parents or parents who introduce them at a very young and emotional age to uh, a, a calling uh, that becomes their profession and their chosen passion, uh, which seems like a contradiction in terms but is not, uh, have an advantage over all others. And the fact that my mother held me before I could really walk and I was dealing with music embeds it in a way that is not otherwise just not possible, that very, very early training. So that rhythmically I have a sense of it, orally I have a sense of it, it's, it's connected to smell, it's connected to taste, it's not a dry thing, it has a great deal of living force to it. I worked at the drive-in. From the time I was eight years old until I went to college, I worked at the drive-in theater my parents owned, uh, either selling tickets or working in the snack bar. Uh, and uh, that's what I did. Weekends, evenings, uh, whenever I wasn't practicing or actually in the car on the way to these lessons. So there was no social life. Well, it was necessary I would be valedictorian. I was valedictorian. Uh, did I enjoy going to school? I hated it. Uh, I hated the, uh, the pressure of the situation because I had to excel. Uh, it wasn't a choice on my part. It was, it was expected. Uh, and uh, in college, I, did, I've, I went a semester, uh, three semesters to Pomona, and then I transferred to Barnard. I graduated in art history, uh, and I was allowed to take uh, outside of the physical education department, all, all the dancing that I could avail myself of in New York, which at the time was really quite extraordinary. So uh, I was privileged to be able to study a year with Martha Graham her last year when she was teaching. Uh, I worked with Merce Cunningham. I worked with Eric Hawkins. Alvin Nicolai was teaching. I was able to join the Taylor Company immediately when I got out. I had classes with Anthony Tudor and Krask, and I saw all the great young dancers coming up in these classes, Cynthia Gregory and and uh, Tony Lander and wonderful, wonderful dancers. Violette Verdi, were, all the city ballet dancers were regulars uh, in the classes that I took. Uh, and consequently, I had a very wide exposure uh, to all of these dance elements when I was still in college. So it meant a double curriculum, but uh, it meant half the time. So there you are.
Martha was very important to me. Uh, I never studied with Balanchine, but he, his work was very important to me. Uh, in terms of academics, I had really, during the course of my entire academic career, uh, from kindergarten through a college degree, only one professor, uh, whose name was Julius Held at Columbia in uh, uh, Flemish iconography, who seemed to be a gentleman who uh, pursued investigation as an art form uh, and was very creative in his work. Otherwise, the formal education that I received made little sense to me. Uh, I've used it. Uh, I'm very grateful to have had it. Uh, I use particularly the, the aspects of art history and that sense of context all the time in working. Uh, I always feel a um, spectrum and parameters to what I do. It's not isolated, and I'm very grateful to having had access to those disciplines. But in terms of individuals who actually inspired, uh, I think that I have to say that very few of the academic people that I had access to were had that had that power over me, and maybe it's simply because I wasn't that committed to geometry. Although actually that's not true. I love geometry. I love forms. Uh, what's part of uh, part of the investigation of space, and I can't even say it about biology because biology is a, is a living thing. I loved English. I write. I uh, have read a great deal. I enjoy books. Uh, I enjoy the use of the English language. I like the wit of the of languages. Even French, I like. I like to be able to think in different modes. Uh, I like to be able to abuse the language a great deal and carry on rehearsals in French, which the French dancers will um, totally um, sort of lay down for because they can't believe what I'm saying. And so there really are, is nothing that I ever had access to that I didn't appreciate. It's just that I don't connect it to an individual for some reason, maybe because it wasn't dancing. And I always someplace knew that I was going to dance, and I wouldn't give that respect to any of these other people who were in these misguided professions where they were not dancing. It has its upsides, it has its downsides. I think that anyone who's pushed to do the very best that they can is privileged. Uh, it, 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 it is indeed, it's a luxury, whether one's coming from a poor family, a wealthy family, uh, that kind of attention is a privilege. On the other hand, uh, the necessity to constantly turn in an excellent performance, to be absolutely rutted uh, and wedded to this dedication and this ideal means that as a child you, you're forced to learn to block out emotions. Uh, and I think this is the case with a lot of overachievers. Uh, and it's not only very painful in a personal life, for many, many overachievers. Uh, but it also so-called overachievers, I don't believe in that concept, there's achieving or not achieving, but in any case, so-called overachievers, uh, pay for it personally and as important in the case of their work, which is where they've vested so much of their, their life force, they short circuit that as well because they don't know how to be able to integrate the, uh, the sense of so many things that are very real and that are very tangible. It's just that we don't study things like fear. We don't study things like excitement. We don't study things like love. We don't study things like mourning. We try as people who have commitments and obligations to blockade those and go our course towards excellence. Uh, and that's a lie. I definitely paid a price. I, everyone pays a price. Everything is an exchange. And once you realize that, you uh, feel uh, empowered because you say, okay, this is what it's going to cost. Do I want to do that? And you say, no, I don't want to go quite that far again. In other words, uh, this spring passed. I was already committed to making two pieces, which I needed to do in a very short period of time. Uh, and uh, I had a major emotional shift in my life, I was not able to take the time to address that because I was committed in a way. Uh, and it has been very costly to me personally. I'll never be in that position again. I, it was too costly and uh, in the future I will uh, make certain that I commit to projects so that there's enough breathing space for me to have an emotional life. And if I need to have a day or two when I need to uh, be able to mourn, I can afford to feel I can take that. I think that 
when I'm in the studio, when I'm warm, uh, when I'm uh, what people call improvising, but what I call futzing, because improvisation seems like such a somehow institutionalized word, and what I do is completely the opposite of institutionalized. It's the messiest thing you can imagine. That when I'm in a certain state uh, where the cerebral powers are turned off and the body just goes according to directive that I know not of, it's at those times uh, that I feel uh, a very special connection to um, But I feel the most right. I don't want to become too mystic about this, but things feel as though they're in the best order at that particular moment. Uh, and it's a short period. Uh, it goes only at maximum an hour. Uh, and I pay a very great price to be able to maintain that. But it is that hour that I, I use the same phrase over and over again that tells me who I am. And I think it's that way for anyone who does anything that is personal to them. There are, there are moments where things come, they don't know where they've come from, and it's the, the business of discovery and being able to have that freshness uh, in your uh, daily procedure that uh, enriches a life, uh, that keeps the discipline that's necessary for any artist from becoming stale. I think that any science re scientist would probably tell you the same thing. I mean, I should speak for scientists, but uh, I think that uh, probably the, the moments of discovery do come from a place that is not too totally organized, because order is something that we already know about. The discoveries are in a place we don't already know about. I had and I have a kind of uh, unstillness about me that has to be constantly tended to. Uh, and I'm hoping that this which I'm talking about, this reintegration of uh, life forces into the working procedure will make me a little less uneasy because I think that I've always had to keep the walls in place and the only way to do that is to keep yourself constantly occupied. That doesn't necessarily mean you're doing good work all the time. You're just doing busy work maybe a lot of the time. I have a son, uh, and I, I don't mean to say that I haven't had a life, uh, and I have. It's just that I have maintained a barricade between the two that uh, I no longer understand uh, and I think has created a certain amount of uh, pain and confusion on both sides of the line, both in terms of the work and in terms of my personal life. I thought I had to make an impact on history. It was quite simple. I had to become the greatest choreographer of my time. That was, that was my, my mission, uh, and that's what I set out to do. Uh, and whether or not that's been accomplished, at least I have the common sense to know we don't determine those things. Posterity deals with us however it sees fit. But uh, I certainly gave it 20 years of my best shot. Nobody likes to see that which they've invested in disappear from the face of the earth before they've even died. This is not cool. Uh, I think that uh, in the case of a piece like As Time Goes By, uh, which was done at a very particular moment in time uh, in the early 70s when this bridge weaving was going on between modern dance and ballet with a bit of hindsight and a bit of historical perspective uh, because my career is now uh, over a quarter of a century, uh, and as the year 2000 approaches, we will have completed a century of dance, and we can now almost see what that looks like, and we can now see what the landmarks, in fact, are. Uh, and for better or for worse, as time goes by, is one of those. Uh, and so when you say, am I troubled by the fact that ephemerally it is at this point in time anyway, non-visible, of course, because it is a document of our time and a document of an art form that is very important uh, and it just is not going to be available to future generations. This is not cool. the key thing. 
uh, the instinct is the item that you register. You attempt to you attempt to catch it, and you attempt to get it as spontaneously and as quickly into a form where you can say exactly what you meant to say. And the longer you struggle with it, the muddier it becomes. That's why the business of skills and techniques is so important, because the more of those you have, the faster you can operate. In and of itself, breaking rules is not an art. Uh, that's simply an extension of and a challenge of what the traditions are. You have to create something either with the rules or without the rules. But simply breaking the rules, which I've done my fair share of, is not all that creative. For me, it's always taking a next step forward. I'm, I, I often say the only thing I fear more than change is no change. Uh, that the business of being static makes me nuts. Uh, and I have to be feeling that each thing that I've learned, uh, I can push to another point next time. I, I'm not very good with repetition. Uh, I would rather not work than feel that repetition is the order of the day. Uh, and consequently, I think that the challenge is always in taking with you what you understand, but pushing it to another point. I don't believe in rupturing and dropping it off and saying, hey, this is done and over with. That, to me, that form of rebellion doesn't make sense. I've always attempted to f familiarize myself with the traditions. Uh, and consider that a responsibility of the artist. I think that it's a bit facile to just go in uh, as the avant-garde traditionally is expected to do and just chop off the past and say, okay, now we start. I go, okay, fine. Seems a little wasteful to me. Let's take what we got and let's push it somewhere and let's use it because why waste all those good lessons about how the body moves? We don't have 300 years. The classical ballet has been working that long, learning lessons of the body. Let's hurry up and get that together so we can go on with it. Any comic is a tragic soul. It's just a part of my nature. It also is true that uh, comedy is one of the things that allows one to survive. It's one of the things that allows one, particularly if one has been in the process of separating off the emotions, it's one place you can process them because you can, I mean, it's why so many humorists are black, uh, why it's, they can look at disaster and tragedy with that kind of overview and skew it and twist it and can't sincerely and directly talk about emotion. Uh, and I think that there's been an element of that in the work. It's also true that comedy is something that allows an audience to engage in art. It, it, it welcomes them in. It allows them to think they can connect with it. And that's always been very important to me. I have not wanted to intimidate audiences. Uh, I have not wanted my dancing to be of an elitist form. That doesn't mean I haven't wanted it to be excellent and absolutely everything that could be accomplished. I just have not wanted it to be elitist. Uh, and I learned very early that an audience would relax and would look at things differently if they felt they could laugh with you from time to time. It became a more human thing, and I encourage that. Plus, which there's an energy, and dancing, after all, is about energy that comes through the release of tension that is laughter. Besides which, it's... I don't know, there's something that sparkles in humor in a way that nothing else does. Uh, and I'm always very, very pleased to see that element when it just comes and it just out. I'm co-writing a movie. Uh, we have a first draft done. Uh, I want to obviously get this movie produced. Uh, and I will direct and choreograph it. It is a uh, a musical of a sort that hasn't really been approached before. Uh, and uh, I have lots of intuitions about musicals because I've worked on five uh, pictures uh, and have always felt a little frustrated because the, the directors who uh, are wonderful directors. Milos Forman is a great director. Jim Brooks is a wonderful, wonderful writer-director. Uh, and uh, it's not that I uh, begrudge their efforts. It's just that they are not, at heart, musical souls. Uh, and uh, I, it's been a long while since there has been a musical soul at the helm. Uh, and I, again, want to say how privileged I feel to perhaps be on the cusp of having this opportunity. Uh, and I'm very, very anxious to exercise it well and curious to see what will happen.